Well, guys, it's that time, and we are headed to the Super Bowl. I remember where the pivot was about a year ago when we just got to the Super Bowl. We're only a month into filming our show, but we're back. This is year two, and Happy Dad is still with us. We want to say thank you for your partnership, and also to DraftKings, thank you for being a sponsor. Now, we have a Super Bowl extravaganza for you today. Lock in for Brian Dawkins. Out there dancing. Dang. <laughs> hey, I remember when uh, when we played y'all in Denver when you were or when you were there. Yeah. You know, I couldn't play by that time. By that time, I'd had uh, my sickle cell crisis there and everything. So the whole week, I was just you, right? So I had to play B dog the really? whole week. Yeah, they gave me a jersey because they knew I wasn't gonna play. So they gave me a jersey, and I was like, "Ain't no way they draw the plays up for him like this." I was like, I stay in the Pro Bowl too. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey. But then, but after I like they let me blitz, you know what I'm saying? I get in, you know, you can't hit the quarterback, but I sack Ben, I'll be running, I'll be going through the field yeah, like that. <laughs> Bro, best week of practice I ever had, dog. Balling. <laughs> Balling. <laughs> hey, that was the first time they didn't care if you picked the quarterback off. You know, the scouts, you're not supposed to pick them all. I will whoop. <laughs> I studied that week. Hold up. Let me listen. Hey man, first of all, just thank you so much. No, it's my uh, pleasure. Thank you for having me, bro. I've never been, been a fan of you guys and the growth. Seriously, been a fan, Thank huge you. fan. Thank you, we appreciate it. Channing, Freddie T, I'm RC. Uh, welcome to The Pivot. This is a Super Bowl edition of The Pivot. Uh, we got one of the greatest of all time, Brian Dawkins, Hall of Famer, nine-time Pro Bowler, five-time All-Pro. I mean, just did it all. They just gave you nicknames. There was Weapon X. It was it was Wolverine. No matter who the coach was, idiot it was... man, idiot man. Don't forget about idiot man. <laughs> idiot, idiot man. Idiot. Is that a? That's all like media man. <laughs> but it's crazy though. I do a show every week. Feels like every day with two Gators, and you come right out of Jacksonville, and you didn't want to go to Florida. I absolutely, a hundred percent. I wanted to be a Gator, brother. I wanted to be an absolute Gator. I had listen. I had practiced my chomp, and you know, going all the way back to uh, Lewis Oliver at safety. You know, what I mean, yeah. way back in the day. You know, what I'm saying uh, was that Will White, another safety back in the day. So looking at those guys, how they played the game, and so I wanted to be a Gator, um, but that wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't in the callings, brother. So basically, you know, short story. So um, I wanted to be a Gator. They, off, they actually offered me a scholarship. They were one of the only schools to offer me a scholarship. I wasn't highly recruited. And so, but my GPA going into my senior year wasn't high enough. So I remember Ron Zook coming and sitting me down in the dean's office and said, you know, we love you, but we're going to have to take the scholarship back. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I got my, got my strong face still. <laughs> <laughs> but I boo-hoo cried in, in Connie's arm at the time. I was, she's my wife, not my girlfriend. But what, what that did, and here's the other, the, the other side of that, is that later on in that day, uh, my good friend, Anthon Lott, who was my other safety, um, you know, he was hyped. And I was like, hey, man, what's going on? He said, yeah, man, the Gator just offered me a scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the way I saw it, they took the one that it was supposed to come to me, and they gave it to my teammate. But here's, here's what it did for me, seriously, though. It made me do something that I probably wouldn't have done without it. I asked one of my coaches, my defensive back coach, Coach Black, to help me because I needed help. I, I was not going to get my GPA where it needed to be in order for me to get a scholarship from somebody else. So I needed help. And here's what he did. He tutored me. He let me come in his class and basically um, off, on, during his off time, he would tutor me on stuff. And he showed me that I learned differently. So I, I killed it for the next four, nine weeks. And I was AB honor roll. So what that did, it actually blessed me that when I then went to Clemson, I knew I can do it. So had I gone to Florida the way that I was about to go to Florida, not knowing I can do it, I don't know if I would have been able to survive there at Florida with my grades. So again, that looking back over that, it was such a blessing for me to go through that painful experience because it made me as a man step up, ask for help. I got it and I killed it when I went to Clemson. You know, you mentioned Connie already and we're definitely gonna speak about your wife and just 
how much she supported you and maybe some lessons you learned along the way about the things that she had to do to enable you or to allow you to be the Brian Dawkins that the whole world, Philadelphia, Denver, all of football grew to love. But you met Connie in high school. High school, high school sweetheart. Yeah. You guys get married at Clemson. I think you got $100 from her grandfather to get rings. But there's a story that without Connie and without her understanding you, loving you and knowing you, we don't get to see the Brian Dawkins that ended up being a Hall of Famer, that in your rookie season, just the pressures of being what you thought you had to be and taking care of family and trying to excel in all these different places drove you to a dark place that when you see Brian Dawkins, the believer, when you see Brian Dawkins, the father, the coach, the husband now, you weren't that man. Can you explain a little bit of what you were going through and how Connie Emmett Thomas uh, helped you out of that? Yeah, wow, powerful. So growing up where I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, um, you know, you rub dirt on everything. So I don't care if it's cut deep womb, you rub dirt on it, like suck it up, man up. Don't let them see you cry. And there's, there's an element to that in the neighborhood, obviously you're gonna have to be fighting at some point. I knew that. So that's the mindset that I had in life period. So I talked to nobody about nothing. So whatever's going on, whatever toxic situations I've been through, whatever traumatic situations I had seen, I talked about none of that stuff. So all of that stuff was basically just being put in little folders inside of me. And I'm thinking I'm being able to contain it and I couldn't. So when pressure, other pressure is in, um, applied to that, you only can white knuckle or as what they call it, things so much. I can only hold on and grip a weight in my hand so long like this. At some point, it's gonna drop. But the way that I explain this is that because I was not talking to, to anybody, it's like you put a hot, pot of water on a stove and you turn the heat up all the way and there's no room for any steam to get out. At some point, that thing is going to explode on somebody. And it takes one person to let that lid off and all that steam. And that's what began to happen with me. I, I was a very angry young man. I was had fits of rage. And one episode in particular is when I ran my head through the wall after an argument, me and Connie, as when we were newlyweds, um, didn't, didn't have any necessary help up in Philadelphia for us. My son, Brian Jr. was colicky, so we weren't getting a whole lot of sleep. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to, know how to talk about my feelings. So all of that stuff just exploded in me doing that thing. And then in that moment, Connie basically called Emmett and they basically tag teamed on me and said, now you're going to get help. And I did, because I, I need to, because what I was doing was not working. I was miserable. I was literally walking around, putting on a mask every day, pretending to be something else pretending to be what other people thought that I should be because I was in the NFL having success, a semblance of success, but I was absolutely miserable. And it's for those who have gone through anything like that, it's in those times that you're by yourself that it's the worst. When I'm out doing stuff, you're cool. When I'm playing football, cool. But when you get in the car, you know, I'm on the way home and I'm thinking about ways of of not being here anymore. I'll see mm. it like that. Wow. How much of that stemmed from the, the actual pressures you know, football of trying to be what you end up being, trying to be the best of the best. How much of the pressure you put on yourself that eventually carried into the house? That was, that was into it as well. So I'm not, I'm not talking about anything. I'm not letting anything that I'm going through out to nobody. So whether that be things that I've saw, I've saw, I've saw growing up with losing a couple of my best friends, one of them at the age of in the ninth grade to the streets, one of them um, when I was a uh, sophomore in college to the streets, like, and I'm talking to nobody about these things. Now I got get into the league second round pick, a lot of expected from me, right? A lot of pressure on me in a, in a, in a city like Philadelphia, it's a lot of pressure on me. Okay. And again, I'm talking about nothing with nobody. I'm letting nothing out and I'm just trying to hold on to everything. And so all of those pressures and the way that I also talk about it now and I understand it now is that pressure reveals what's, when, what's really in your heart. You know, out of the abundance, the mouth speaks is what the pressure word talks privilege. about, right? So that pressure will show you what you are, good or bad, right? And what that pressure showed me is that I needed help, yeah. that I doggone needed help, and I finally got it. As you speak about, like, those fits of rage and things that can come over you, um, there's a, they, they talk a lot about, like, guys turning on and off a switch on the field, that competitiveness, that go get them, and then you got to go be in the real world. You got to communicate with your spouse, communicate with people in the world. Like, to have that and know that, but the way you played was rageful. 
So have you ever thought about, you know, where, did, was your switch not working where you couldn't turn it off? And would you be who you are if that rage wasn't in you? The rage that you speak of. So the rage basically is energy, is what it is. How you use it is up to you. So the way that I was given to this, and this is me, this is me going into now my second and third year when I really began to study and read the word of God. This is what came to me and helping me do exactly what you're talking about. Use that in a different way. So when you have water and it comes in a flash flood, it destroys everything in its path. If you have a dam up and you have vents to be able to allow some water to come when you want it to, that same flush of water now gives that engine that you're opening those gates up to more power. So in my mind, I now have a way to direct this extra energy, that rage you're talking about. Now I can use this thing to destroy this dude coming across the middle. <laughs> I can, I can, yeah, I can, I can use this rage when I go into the weight room to really get that last couple of reps in to make me, you know, you, you feel me? Yeah, yeah. So me being able to understand the significance of that, and I still apply those same thoughts today. Like, just because that I'm feeling a specific way does not make me the thing that I feel. I can choose to use that energy in a different way. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So again, so that enlightenment for me to be able to think about things in this way allowed me to go take the field differently. And later in my career, when I went to, to Denver, um, when I went to Denver, I was so angry with a couple of people that with the, with the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm not going to say no names, but a couple of people, I was so livid. But here's the thing. I wasn't in a power position by the way that I was thinking because I had so much like, anger towards, and I'm gonna go show them, I'm gonna go show them. Then again, in that same study time, he's still getting down and praying about it. It hit me. Go show yourself right. Don't go prove them wrong. Go show yeah. yourself to be right. That's an empowering place. So now I don't, I'm not doing it to impress you or to make you think that you made a mistake, even though I did what I did to, you know, I, I did actually do that. Yeah. But the point is, I'm doing it to go prove me right. Yeah. It's no longer giving you the power. So I'm taking my power back. Does that make sense? Yeah. A lot of the things that I see in my life now, I recognize that perspective is the key to it all. It's your perspective of how you see the thing. That's what drives the thing. And it can either empower you or it can take power from you. You mentioned proving yourself right. And I think that's a different approach because now your, your life or your self-worth or the way you appreciate what you've accomplished has nothing to do with outside voices. It's all about you. It's all about saying, I put this work in to get to this certain point and I did what I needed to do for me and mine. Yeah. And I think that's just such a different perspective. But once Jim Johnson becomes the, the defensive coordinator, this is when we realize that Brian Dawkins is not just a second round pick from Clemson. This is a third man. round pick. First pick of the third round. He's first ahead. pick of the third round? No, I was the last pick in the second round, but in my mind, I was the first pick of the third <laughs> hey, round. Hey, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was go like, ahead, man, I did all that studying <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> okay. So that was motivation for me to yeah. use that way, but go ahead, go ahead. You know, and so you, you weren't just that guy. You become the premier strong safety in the entire league, and it's all pros and it's Pro Bowls. And when you are now starting to see the fruits of your labor, what does that feel like for you? Man, before I get to that, let me give you the reason why I was able to do what I did with Jim. It was because of Emmett Thomas. Mm. See, Emmett Thomas saw something in me that I could not see. I just saw a hard working dude. I saw a dude coming out of Jacksonville was too small. Everybody thought couldn't do nothing, do this, do, do that, the other. And I was just using that anger to just make, try to go just, 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 just to make the team. I didn't know as a second round pick that you're not likely going to get cut in the first, at least the first couple of years. So I'm literally, I'm serious. I'm literally going into my locker doing training camp, peeking around the corner to see if I got one of them slips. I'm serious. In my mindset, you can cut me at any time. So I, I just didn't know. What Emmett did though is Emmett never let me settle for good. So even when I was doing good in practice, good in the games, he kept like, like, getting on me. I'm like, man, I thought I was doing good. He said, no, you should have done that. With your talent, he, kept, he would always say, they can do that. You should be able to do that. You should be doing this. So here's what, here, here's what I had to do. I had to believe in Emmett's vision of me and go after that for a little while. And once I recognized what Emmett was saying, because he was putting me in the, in the same sentence as Ronnie Lott, and that's the dude I looked up to. So I'm like, are you serious? So 
when I finally understood that and I understood what I can do, Emmett unleashed the beast inside of me. He, he unleashed everything. That I thought that I could, a lot of the things that I didn't know I can do. And then Jim got that. He got that dude ready. Then Jim just unleashed me in every way. So I want to go back to Emmett because that start, started a question in my mind when I heard you say that. How much of Emmett's words meaning so much to you was the fact that he and Connie took you out of that dark place, that he showed you that it was more than about the Ronnie Lott or the Ronnie Lott type player that you could be. And it was about, no, let's make sure Brian is all right. Because I feel like when you have that sort of relationship, now when I tell you, you should be doing this, those guys can do that, those words hit different to me because I know you really care about me. So how much about Emmett's vision of you did you take to heart because he cared about Brian Dawkins, the man? And that was the thing about it. When I got to Philadelphia, you got to understand that Emmett was there, you know, uh, African-American defensive coordinator. Ray Rowe was there, African-American. Mr. Wooten was the general manager at the time, not general manager, he was a player, director player personnel mm -hmm. at the time, you know, African-American. So b basically I had a bunch of my uncles, the way that I saw it. So my, the way, <laughs> so the way that some of my uncles talked to me in the neighborhood is sometimes the way that they would talk <laughs> to me. You, you feel right. me? So, so when I trusted Emmett and I knew that he cared for me outside, cause he would always talk about me and Connie and talk about the things that I needed to be doing as a man even in my household. So I knew that he was talking to the, to, to the person. So, and the way that I say it, that, that oftentimes in society, in the workplace, and even on the practice field, everybody's talking about coaching the player. No, if you coach the person first though, if you help that person first, you will, have a, you will get a better player, you'll get a better employee, but we don't look at things that way. And that's what Emmett did. So when he came to me and began to say those things to me, I believed him. I 100% believe, now I didn't think, I, I didn't know I, it would go to the point of me being a Hall of Famer. I, I did not dream that big, but I believed in his vision of me and I chased it. And once again, once I saw what I can do, to your point, what, how did I touch the field, Ryan? There was nothing on the field I didn't think that I can do. Like when I touched the field, dude, like, like I was free. It literally felt like there's nothing that I could not do. Whatever I'm asked to do, I can do it, and I'm excited to be able to do it. So I don't know if any, I don't know if people will have that experience in their lives at at any point in any area. But I'm telling you, when I touched the field, so the reason why I was so crunk and yelling and all that stuff was not to get hype. It's because I was hype, because I knew what I was about to do. Y'all, they just didn't. They just did. <laughs> Seriously, they just did. And Brian, saying that. <laughs> And when people would see you Ooh, away from when, <laughs> when people oh, would see you away from ooh, the field, goodness. it's a it's a totally different person. So uh the dichotomy between Weapon X and Brian Dawkins, like how did you balance that and, and, and keep Weapon X tucked away? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the people out in the public, they don't see that. They see a very faith-filled, approachable, loving human being. Growing up, I was a stutterer. I was a stutterer. People don't really know this, but I was a stutterer. So that, that in itself caused me to be more introverted because I didn't want to say something that people pick at me now, mm -hmm. you know, so I was, always, I was always an introvert in that way. But when you really look at the thing that when I became, when I became a believer, when I accepted Christ into my life in, in, in 90, 91, I was looking for an example of what I can do playing football. Because in my mind, you, you know, on the football field, you, you know, you, you causing damage, right? You can't, so you can't be this image that people have about, you know, turning the other cheek all the time and being passive and all right. that stuff. And then I watched the Philadelphia Eagles back then. And there was this dude by the name of Reggie White. And I saw Reggie play. I saw him <laughs> dominate on the field. I saw Reggie actually dominate on the field hurt a person and then pray over him. I was like, that's it. I see it. <laughs> I see it. I see it. I can go out and act a, I can, the way I call it, I can go out and act a fool on the field, but then if something goes down in that moment, I remove myself from it and I, I can pray for that individual. So that means off the field, I need to handle myself in a way though that reflects the God that I serve. So that was that, that, was that dichotomy. I okay. knew that my, I needed to be able to reflect um, in everything that I do, I need to be able to point people to the God that I serve. And on the field, the Bible says that you do everything as unto the Lord. Right. So if I didn't go out on the field and just do what I did, the way that I played the game, 
If I didn't do it, then I'm not praising God. That's the way that I saw it. Right. And so that allowed me to play it on the game. But now off the field, I took responsibility for, put it this way, you as my teammate, you would have never had to worry about me not being ready for game day. You would have never had to say, I hope he's not out doing something late at night. I hope he won't. I hope he can give me everything that he got, not just what he has left. That's, that's, I wanted that. I, and, and from a fan standpoint, you would never read about me in the paper, anything other than something exemplary, uh, exemplary right? Mm -hmm. So, and that was my mindset. So that's how I approached that thing. You know, just to say this really quick, man, in preparation for this, I reached out to a few of your former teammates. And what they speak about is love, the way they love you and Connie. They speak about the impact that you've made on every player in the locker room. And they just speak on how grateful they are for everything wow. that, you, that you all have done. So I, I, can, I, I see the, the transparency and the vulnerability, and I totally believe it. But I also wanted to go here and ask you, uh, uh, how, how many times did you pray to God when you were going home to Jacksonville to the 2005 Super Bowl, <laughs> the first Super Bowl in your hometown, an opportunity to win it in front of your coaches, your family, you know, your, 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 your church people, everybody that you've ever seen or touched growing up. Take us to that night. Man, it was so many emotions coming back, going back at that time for me, coming back to Jacksonville, so many emotions. And people have to recognize that at that point, we had lost three straight NFC Championship games to get to the Super Bowl. So when you go back and look at that celebration of the fans and us on the field, finally getting past Atlanta to go to the Super Bowl, like we celebrated almost like we won a dog on Super Bowl because again, we had lost three in a row. So going to Jacksonville to play, you know, one of the things that I took from a veteran, I can't remember who it was, that you try to do everything like you've done it before. So you keep your preparation the exact same. And so that's what I tried to do when we went to Jacksonville. I didn't, do, I didn't go visit family a whole lot. I did exactly what I would do if, was out, if, if I was in, 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 in Jacksonville. And in my mind, I was literally thinking we were going to win that game. And I, there was nothing in me that we weren't going to win that, win that game. So um, definitely heartbroken. We talked about it. You know, I did. I shared some tears after we lost. But in my mind, we were coming back. Like, in my mind, if we... <laughs> And we had people that, you know, kind of stick, stick to their, <laughs> <laughs> stuck to their guns a little bit and, you know, said they were sorry and, you know, came together and um, we would have been back. But that didn't happen. And it took a couple more years, took all the way into my, my last year for us to get back to another industry championship game. Oh boy, still ain't apologize. <laughs> still, still ain't apologize. Hey, hey, if you couldn't go back and get a championship, ain't no use to apologize yeah, enough. No use to <laughs> but be, like, just listen to you talking that passion and then like being a, cause uh, losing the Super Bowl, Ryan got a Super Bowl, but he got carried by Footy and 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 Pot. He got carried by Peasy. He got carried. Don't forget by Troy. 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 Oh, Troy carried him every play. That's like he can run around. But I also lost one. Where were, hey, I wish they'd have carried me that night. Then when Aaron Rodgers was carving us up. <laughs> yeah, because you know, hey, that's what he was supposed to pick himself up. He, he, he blaming on Aaron. That's him. He didn't me. But. But for you to be all world everything, we all knew you, man. You know, everybody at that age, I ran out the little tunnel crawling and all. <laughs> like, it, you know, the impact you have, I'm sure you heard of it. But the, not having that control, because I thought about it when you just said, yeah, we we're supposed to do it the next year, and then some people ain't. Like, I, I wasn't no all pro Hall of Fame type player. To be that good and to not know these guys can't play with me or not doing what it takes to get on my level, What's, what's that like? Because I can't even speak on it. I was the dude, I'll be honest, they know it. I was the dude you talking about. I was the dude <laughs> Friday night, yeah. I'm going out. Yeah. I'm getting to practice on Friday. We ain't got but a little quick well, practice. Right, right, right. I can sweat the lick out then. <laughs> <laughs> we fly to Buffalo Saturday. I'm going straight to Toronto to go to the strip club. You know, I was that guy. Yeah. Speak to me if you're on my team. Like, oh, man. <laughs> well, like, what do you tell those dudes that don't have that love and passion like you have? So the only thing that I can do is the example that I gave and the way that I prepared myself and the results coming from that. So the results that I was blessed to then do does not allow you to see that maybe I need to try this out. Maybe I need to test this out. Maybe me giving just what I have left is not enough. Maybe if I try, it's, if I just try what he doing, maybe it'll work out. Maybe I would be a better player. I would be actually able to earn more money 
that can bless my family for a longer period of time. You see what I'm saying? So all yeah. of these things. So it was always about the example. I can't make, I can't make a grown man do nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't. I can urge you. I can, I can, I can um, ask you. I can, um, uh, again, I give you the example. Now, if you've asked me to be an accountability partner, that's different. Yeah, I, can, yeah. I can help hold you accountable in that way. But other than that, I can't make you do nothing. The third IV that I had to get <laughs> will let you know just how much winning was, yes, but how much you mean to me. Mm. Does this make sense? So yeah, the yeah. way that I always looked at it, when I go out and play the way that I play to help us win more games, more, ga more games on your record will help you earn more money as well. So I wasn't just doing what I was doing to make me more money. I'm doing, we all yeah, can if we, we can all eat off and this I'm thing. I'm showing you yeah, how to eat. Yeah. You know, my man, Zach Thomas, that's my yeah. big brother to yeah. the Dolphins. Yeah. He was my accountability partner, but it was accountability for him to wake me up because I was sleeping in my truck every morning before practice because I go straight to the facility. <laughs> <laughs> we, diff we different, bro. <laughs> yeah, we are. Okay. But here's the thing, man. I understood that, and, and that's why, and I'm not going to call, like, call guys out. Like, I, there's certain guys that I would maybe nudge just a little bit. I would just have a car, and I would never, I'm never doing stuff out in public. It was always me sitting down beside you. Yeah. We'd be in the steam room together, or you know, we'd hot or whatever, getting warmed up together, and I mentioned a couple of things, man. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. To get you to just think differently, because if I can help you think differently, you have an opportunity to do different. Yeah. That was always my thought process. If I can get you to just think differently, to do this thing just a little bit more, or to stop doing that a little bit more, then you'll be able to give a little bit more. And so on that fourth down that you needed that extra oomph to get that big dude off you, you will have that extra oomph and then we'll get off the field instead of giving up that first down, the offense run down the clock, and then we on the defense sitting on the other side just watching them kneel the ball out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. yeah. You know, the teams that people see us play on aren't necessarily the most important team. Not even aren't necessarily. They aren't the most important teams in our lives. It's our families. It's our wives. It's our children. And... In 2007, the twins were born. Whew. And that wasn't just about the normal, everyday births that we see. You know, they say when a woman is pregnant or giving birth, it's the closest thing to death on earth. And you actually had to live that. And then having one of the twins who is struggling and you having to be on alert and shake her leg just to make sure mm. she's moving, but also trying to still be Weapon X and prepare to be Weapon X in the season while being not only the man of the household, but the caretaker, the provider. What was that experience in year like for you? Man, first, brutal. Number one, brutal. Heart-wrenching. Um, test the heck out of my faith. But it also let me see the plight of my wife, the responsibilities that I just didn't, I just didn't know. Like, and, some of it was from a place of selfishness, I, I will admit that. But other was, it's just I didn't know. When we go off to work, man, we go off to work. We're going into the you know, office, excuse me, you're going into meetings. You, you, you're preparing to go sac, you know, do stuff on the field. And so you have to learn these things, learn these plays. You were, we were talking about, Fred, a little earlier, some of the, the tips that you would have to right. come up with to help you, you know, be, better be able to play. So that's what we're all in, we're all into that. And so... I'm not necessarily understanding all that she had to do until I had to be mom. So she was on bed rest, Connie was on bed rest for a couple of times. And so I had to be mom and dad, especially when, the, when she was about to give birth to the twins. So they were born two months prematurely. Um, the youngest had something called bradic cardia, a bradic cardia, which means that she would stop breathing and her heart would stop just for a split second. So when you're feeding her, she would stop breathing and you would have to shake her, and she would, and then she would come, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when they were born two months prematurely, they had to stay another extra month in the hospital, and Connie had to uh, spend that uh, another month because of complications as well in the hospital. And um, so testing my faith, because now I have to trust that the doctors are going to make sure that, that she's breathing the whole night. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's, it's completely out of my hand. But here's the other thing. The, uh, the other two didn't stop being Brian Jr. and Brianna. I had to then cook for them the best I could, uh, <laughs> do, uh, do hair the best I could with my messed up fingers. Um, and so a lot of that, I wasn't able to train the way that I was normal training. 
But again, I got a chance to see all of the things that she had to do. And then I was trying to do all the things that I had to do. And consequently, you know, that's the year I hurt my neck. And so I knew, I, I, listen, I knew, in my mind, I was going to, into training camp like they used to do back in the day to get ready for the season. Because I wasn't ready. I knew it. I knew I was not ready. I, it was to the point that when they came home from, from the uh, hospital, dude, I had to basically spend, take the night shift. And that shift. was Mother's Day when they came When they home. came home. Yep. Right. So, but I had to take the night shift. So what I would do is I would take the night shift trying to feed one twin while the other one sleep. But one of them would take so long that she's crying, so I have to try to... So the whole night, and I would go to bed around 6 o'clock in the morning, sleep to about 11 to 12, and then try to work out, and then go pick the kids up from school. You see what I'm saying? So that was my... I couldn't do it. I guess, so again, I literally told Connie, if I've ever um, not given you the appreciation for what you, what you do around this office, if I've ever... Um, disappointed you in, in any type of way when it comes to the, these things, I apologize because I see what you do now and I'm so thankful to have you. I'm so thankful. So thankful. It kind of comes up in all your stories, your football stories, your life stories, your religious story, like everything is kind of, y'all, y'all met in high school? Yeah. What did Connie do to you? Oh man, so, 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 <laughs> so, so here's the thing though, I actually saw Connie on a, in a basketball game in the ninth grade. I was going to one school. She was a cheerleader for another school. So, you know, we're playing a game. And I saw her at that time. I didn't know I would then meet her in the 10th grade at range coming together. And the short story there was I'm, I'm not a talker. I'm, I'm someone that's laid back. So a good friend of mine, Maurice, told her that she, I wanted to meet her. And um, that's how we met up. And, and the rest is history. But she has blessed me in so many ways because... There's certain things I had to stop doing to be with her in the first place. So it's a certain lifestyle that the neighborhood would try to present that if I, had, if I was going to be with her, I had to stop. So that was a blessing in that way. The church she went through, went to, was different from how I grew up. And they, they were doing things in that church that I, I had never seen before. So that helped me grow spiritually. So it's so many things that I've, I've been blessed to have in Connie. And then ultimately going all the way back, going you know, to, to my rookie year, you know, she was one of the main reasons that I went and got help. And I understand the power of getting that help. You, sh you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so she's yeah. been so influential in so many aspects of me growing into the man that I've become. When did y'all uh, start watching film together? <laughs> 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 was it before the 50 50 or after the 50 50? <laughs> so, man, so <laughs> I would come, I would be on the way home, and she would be told, well, why you didn't make that play? Now, why, why, what, you, what happened on this play? What happened like, why, why are you supposed to be on my side? <laughs> why, why you didn't make that? Why you didn't do that? But so again, so she always, she's always been that type of person in my life to encourage me, to push me, to not let me settle either. So I've been so blessed in so many aspects to have someone <laughs> like that, to not just be someone that smiles and say everything's okay. But no, nah, nah, you, now nah, that was bad. She would laugh, she would literally, she would literally say, no, nah, that was bad. That, that, that looked ugly. I'm like, man. <laughs> And you know it's the truth. And too, I know it's the, the truth. I know it's the truth. That's the one hit you harder. I know it's the truth. You know what? It's funny because that's like a movie thing. We meet in high school. She was at the rival school, and I saw the cheerleader. I'm an athlete. Now that's, we meet up that's later. That's real. And now y'all together this this much longer. Y'all together through all of this. I want to ask, what was the hardest point? Cause. I make fun of everything, man. You was a stuttering little kid. You ain't gonna get the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> real, real talk. So in, in, in my mind, there's no way since she talks to someone like me. I'm, 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 yeah. yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like, man, was stuttering. That's why you ain't wanna walk up to her. Yeah. You was never gonna finish. You was never gonna put Maurice on it. You was never gonna finish this sentence. <laughs> right. Hey, uh, hey. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. But, but from that, the start of it, yeah. but through becoming a star in, in college, in college, to become drafted, to becoming what you are, to all the way through Hall of Fame, like, bro, it's a lot of benchmarks in there that I would say aren't advantageous, especially early on, for a relationship that deep. What, what, what Was there any hurdles there? What was the hardest part of being married since you was, or being with your lady since before you could even, you didn't even pay taxes? Man, I, I, for me, because this, this, this phenomenon in my life was the thing that blessed me the most, that let me understand that what I was going after should be what I saw in front of me. And what I mean by that is my parents. Mm -hmm. I saw them together. I saw them work through stuff. 
I saw them work through stuff sometimes at a loud pitch. Right? Sometimes they work through stuff. <laughs> but they work through stuff. And so I saw that as the example that I wanted to have in my relationships. So when me and Connie, again, I didn't think that she would go out with a dude like me. So when she said yes, and she was my girlfriend, and here's the thing, people, people will now be, me being in the league, be like, so when did you get with him, right? When he got, after he got his money. Listen, she had a car, I didn't. She would come pick me up for school mm. to drive us to school. Because of her, I've started eating sushi, right? So she, she introduced me to so many different <laughs> things, bro. Yeah. But, but, but the point is, is that I knew in her I had something special. And I was not doing, gonna do something stupid to jeopardize that. Like seriously. Yeah. Like one of the things that when I went to Clemson, she stayed in Jacksonville, and um, that was a tough. That was a tough first year in, in a lot of aspects. How I got to Clemson, people don't recognize this and realize this. How I got to Clemson was basically they wanted a dude named Patrick Sapp. I don't know if y'all heard no Sapp. So Sapp was big in, in Jacksonville, Florida. So Clemson wanted him so bad that they told him, but he told them that if I come to Clemson, Dalton got to come with me. I didn't know that. Mm. I thought they wanted me, right? right? But this is, again, this is after Florida yanked back the scholarship. Um, but once I got to Clemson, I recognized that, yeah, I, do, I was not wanted there. I can, I can feel it. Like, you can just feel it. Like, yeah, you can, you can you, yeah, you can tell, man. Like, I, I was not wanted there, but in my mind, there's nobody, you can't break me physically because my mental conditioning, you can't break me physically. So whatever you put in front of me, I'm going to crush it. And I'm gonna outwork everybody around me. That was my mindset that I developed in high school. And so when I went to Clemson that first year, it was absolutely miserable. And Connie wasn't there. And mm. there was no fun. We didn't have them things there yeah. to, to pick up and fall. So we, I'm writing letters, bro. I'm stamps. Can, can you get a roll of stamps? <laughs> we writing letters back. So I gotta wait a couple of days to get the answer back. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. we, we didn't have no money to be having no cars and paying extra yeah. money. We just didn't have that type of money. So, you know, one of the blessings that happened is what she came up to Clemson that next year. And, and that was a blessing. And then soon after that, we got married. So, and I would have done, I would have done that so much differently too. <laughs> we eloped, we eloped with the $100 and yeah, I would have done that so different. But again, I just knew in my mind, you know, I just knew that she was going to be the person I was going to spend the rest of my, my life with. Man, that's, I think those type of stories are inspiring it's not about taking the leap to doing it, it's about doing the work to keep it. Those are the things that people can look at and say, it's not about perfection though, it's about the pursuit, the pursuit of it. And in your career, your life, it seems that, that that's what it was always about. 13 years in Philly, three years in Denver, retire at 38. And whenever people put your film on, they put the film on and the first thing you think is, he couldn't play like that now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's the first thing they think. Right. And then you also look and say, I wonder what he's like now. I wonder how his mental is. I wonder how he is emotionally. And we were talking earlier about how you have really started to study and learn about the brain because you want to help the next generation of athlete, the next generation of player. How have those studies, though, helped you in coping since you retired? So not necessarily coping, mm -hmm. it's understanding. Okay. Understanding how a dude from Jacksonville, Florida, not really expected to do a whole lot, being small as I was at the time, how that individual changed his mindset and went after something a whole lot bigger than what his neighborhood suggested. My neighborhood only suggested that I was gonna be able to do specific things, right? It's gonna be able to, um, if, I, if I sold dope the right way, I'll be able to get me a Jeep Wrangler. Jeep Wranglers were the thing at the time. Get you a Jeep, uh, no, sidekick, Jeep sidekick. <laughs> yeah. Put some knock, put some knock in the back, right? You know what I mean? I'm just yeah. being real with you, right? So, you know, that was that's what I saw in my neighborhood. But 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 the pursuit of what it is that I went after, ah, these stories keep coming back. Of I had a vision. Somebody blessed me to have a scholarship, an FCA camp, and I went to North Carolina. This person I would never ever meet allowed me to see something in that FCA camp in the neighborhood. The neighborhood was a plush one, similar to this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said to myself after leaving that, I said, me and my family are gonna live into a spot like this. Me and my family, my wife and my kids are gonna live in a neighborhood like this. So whatever I gotta do, whatever I gotta become, I'm gonna become that. Wow. And that's, that's the vision. So I began to drop off with some of the dudes I was hanging out with. And I, if they weren't going to help me be able to get, get, reach that vision, I'm giving you some real stuff here now. Yeah. 
And that changed the outcome and the trajectory of my life because I began to pray on that thing, to believe in that thing, and to chase that thing, chase that vision of me living in a, in a plush environment and having my kids be able to, to, to grow up in a place that was not like my own. And so that was an empowering tool for me that allowed me to see the end, to see the end, and then go back to the beginning and work my way to it. That's vision, visionary. As I begin to learn about how the brain operates, I understand how I was doing what I was doing. I didn't know I was programming my brain to think the way that I was thinking, but I was doing that. I was creating new neural pathways. I was um, prep, uh, priming myself to have success in a lot of ways. And these, some of the things that I'm saying is, is some of the terminology that is used in these realms. But I, I began to do things and go after something that I believe had already happened in my life. Because I, I can feel what it was going to be like to live in the neighborhood. I can feel what it's going to, I can feel in that moment when I begin to dream about that, how it's going to feel to pull up to that gate and, and just be able to pull right through with no. <laughs> I, I begin to write out my autograph saying that someday somebody's going to be paying me for this thing. I, be, I begin to do that, all that stuff around in 11th grade, 12th grade. Having these visions, having these concepts, having these dreams. Again, I didn't know I was programming my brain. I was something called the reticular activating system in, your, system in your brain. When you, for instance, before you got those shoes, you probably didn't notice a lot of other people wearing them. But once you got those shoes, you begin to see a whole lot of people wearing the exact same shoes. Why? Because the reticular activated system in your brain recognizes those things that you've made important. Those were important to you. So now you see so many, and it's the same thing in our lives. When you begin to go after that thing that you have already seen yourself have success in and you begin to pray on that thing, your brain begins to operate in such a way as to help you recognize those things to help you get to it. So for those dudes that wouldn't help me get to it, I was like, nah, we good. And so I'm, I'm, and I wasn't like rude. I was like, nah, I'm good. So y'all finna go to the store. Don't none of us have no money. Nah, I'm good. Because right. in my mind, I know what y'all yeah, about to do. I'm serious. I'm just, we ain't got no money. So, yeah, we ain't got no money. So now I'm good. I'm good. Y'all go ahead. Oh, you trying to be funny? No, I'm, I'm good. I'm serious. Y'all go ahead. Again, they weren't, they, 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 they weren't going to help me get where I wanted to go. Right? And so ultimately, Ryan, you know this about me. When I discover something for myself, I don't believe that that thing that I, I discover is for me. It's for other people. So I'm supposed to share what I have. We're supposed to share the victories in our lives that we've had that God has given us. We're supposed to share them with other people to allow them to receive their versions of the same victory. Maybe it's not Hall of Fame in the NFL. Maybe it's not playing 16 years in the National Football League. Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it's, you know, having your own uh, trucks, uh, 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 food trucks or something. Maybe it's something, but, but, but it's something. It's something inside. And again, if I have something that I've done in my life that can help you reprogram the way that you're thinking, to get out, get out of that stinking thinking, to be able to achieve something great in your life, man, man, I'm selfish if I keep it to myself. So that's, that's the road I'm on now. Hey man, it's the big game week and the number one seeds made it, Philly, KC. It's time for everything for all the marbles. And so is DraftKings and it's still the same old sweet deal. Any new customer signing up with the promo code PIVOT, you bet at least $5 on the big game, and you get $200 in additional bets. And now being the big game, you know what these teams are? Consistent. And I'm going to stay with my consistency <laughs> of the same game parlay. The NFC done had a little run now in the big game, but I'm telling the AFC's taking it this year. Same game parlays. Bet multiple bets on the same game and have a chance of winning even more money. Hey, and Chan, even though it's the big game, nothing really changes on my side. RC mentioned the promo code PIVOT. No, you guys go pivot from the sports book to Daily Fantasy. They got both because the sports book not everywhere. Just use the promo code PIVOT and get that money. RC will tell you the rest. Absolutely. Get out your devices. Freddie T showed you his. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Any $5 bet on any of these games. Wait. It's actually only one game because it's the big week and you get $200 in additional bets. That's DraftKings Sportsbook app. People want to know how you're doing now because you were such a physical player and hard hitter. Um, was there ever a moment you were afraid? Because we've seen players like former Eagles great Andre Waters. You know, we've seen him commit suicide. 
um, Junior Seau. Junior Seau. You know, a lot of other players. And I know I was scared because people tell you you should develop this. Do you ever have those moments? So, so, so here's the thing for me, and this is before all of these things came out and we began to talk about these things. This one individual told me something my rook, going into my second year that blessed me to see my life and do things completely differently early on in my life, in my career, than I probably would have had I not had that conversation with him. We were walking into the, the, um, in the vet at the time. I was walking into the restroom. He was already in there shaving. And, um, and for whatever reason, he just said, Rook, Rook, if you take care of your body now, it'll take care of you later. Okay. This is Irvin Fryer. And at that yeah. time, Irv was like year 13, still making Pro Bowls, and he was balling, right? And I took that to heart. And so what I began to do is I began to do things different, didn't eat differently. I began to take, look into supplementations. I've been taking fish oil ever since. So I've been taking things that help the, 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 the brain okay. function better. I've been taking those things for a long, 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 long time. Now, to your point, fear, absolutely, you have, you have some trepidation sometimes, right? Because I, I look at some of the hits, man, like, yeah, it, yeah, it, it was. And in the moment, and it's hard for my wife to understand this, and it's hard for me to understand a little bit too now because I've, I have more sense now. <laughs> I didn't care about my body. Right. Playing the game, I didn't, I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking in that for the realm of me getting hurt. I just knew that I needed to do this thing. My teammates were counting on me and I got to do this thing. So I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get it done. That's, that was my mindset. But because I've been doing these things for so long and, you know, the way that the supplementations I've been taking for all of these years, I believe that I've been helping myself help myself. Obviously, I say it like that for a long time. And I did, again, I didn't know I was doing it. Now that we're stepping to this realm of me understanding how the brain works a lot more, I understand that what I was doing for so many years was literally doing that, was helping me help myself in life after football. Makes sense. You know, when you speak, people listen. And it's been since you played and even now, I think your voice carries more weight because you can hear the wisdom in everything you say. And sometimes it's the experiences that we have that we try to give people so they, so they don't have to have them, right? So they don't, uh, don't have to go through them. And so for you, though, you never got that winning experience of that Super Bowl. And in 18 and when you know, the Eagles and the Pats play, and now you're a part of the front office. You get the, the Weapon X ring. And I thought it was dope that it didn't say Brian Dawkins. Yep. Right? Because that wasn't the dude who that played wasn't the dude. <laughs> on, on game day. Never played a snap. <laughs> on game day. Brian anyway. Dawkins never played a snap. <laughs> and never so, played a snap. And then Andy Reid gets an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl as well in 2020. And you actually said before he, they played the game that you'd probably shed a tear if Andy won. That's a, that's a large statement for another man who is not quote unquote or, or not blood family. What was it about your relationship that made you feel that way? Man, so it's, first of all, it's the, it's the, it's the fact that I, I'm comfortable doing that. Yeah. So I'm comfortable crying. Um, I, have, I wasn't for a long time, but yeah, like men, oftentimes we as men think that the, the, the the only emotion that we should readily show is anger. Like you're tough, angry, you know, ball up your, fit, ball up your fist, you know, we're gonna, let's do what we need to do. But understanding that we are, we have emotions where we are not built or, uh, we are not our emotions, I'll say it that way, but we do have emotions. And being tearful is one of those doggone emotions that we need to be able to show. Now, I'm not saying you cry about everything. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but my point is, is that if, 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 if my brother, and the Bible talks about it like this. If my brother is having problems, issues, I need to step into that space to feel what my brother is feeling so that I can hopefully help them in this situation. So if you, Ryan, you called me up and you told me something you're going through, you are now lifting a lot, half of the thing that you're going through because I'm lifting the other half. So that's a little bit less. And then we both pray together and get it completely off of us both. But it's that same respect when it comes to Elation. So if my brother is winning and he's won, I'm, man, I'm, I'm jumping around just like it was me, right? I'm more happy. I'm happy. Like, so, so when Andy won, like I literally, because it wasn't just Andy, it was Andy and Spags. 
So Spags was my defensive back coach okay. at the time, back in the day, and went on to be with the Giants and so forth and so on. So I'm happy for them to do so. I'm literally tearing up and like jumping for joy and like I'm a fan. I'm low, my goodness. You feel me? But that's what I'm supposed to do. And I don't do it because I'm supposed to. I do it because I want to. You feel me? Because that's what that relationship meant to me of watching Andy come into the Philadelphia Eagles, kind of right the ship, and then let's go on that magical run year after year. Right? you got, I mean, and not everybody, I, I got this and it really hit me when we went to the Super Bowl in 2004 and we had Jeff Blake on our team. Jeff Blake had played, I think at that time, had played like 15 years and had never went to a playoff run. Wow. Never been in the playoffs. And here we are year after year after year. And you mentioned something when we were talking earlier when you first came into the league. You thought you were going to go to the championship game year after year, yeah. to the uh, Super Bowl year after year after year. But so that perspective was, it's like this for everybody, and it's not. So the, <laughs> the catalyst for that, but, and, and so the catalyst for that was Andy Reid right. coming, bringing him and Jim Johnson, bringing what they bring. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm eternally grateful for them coming to Philadelphia and doing what they did. Oh, so, so you gonna have the split jersey? No! <laughs> no, 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 you no, love Andy. no, Man, no, 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 <laughs> love him now, love him. Yeah, lo love him now. And it's a little different for me now because as a player, like if me and Ryan, we don't, you know, we know each other, we boys. I'm not, I'm not talking to you during that week though. Right. I'm not even called, we ain't no Texas. And I, I know some players do that. Me, during that week, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know your mama. I don't know none of y'all. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want no feelings for that. That, that we, That's just me now. That's just me. So yeah. So but as a, I'm no longer a player like that. So obviously I can, I can indulge. But when it's all said and done, it's, it's Eagles, dog. It's Eagles. Well, be quickly, just because me and Freddie got something we always talk about. We played each other in the preseason game, and I took a cheap shot on him. Is that too far? Preseason, yes. That's too far. Yeah, okay, Fred, my bad. You apologize. My you bad. Season, dog. <laughs> B dog, you know, when even texting and trying to catch up with you this year, the NFC Championship game, you're you're a part of the celebration. And not, I'm just let's be real. They don't invite everybody back, B dog. Like that's not the way it works. There are there are some great players who don't get invited back. There are actually more good men that don't get invited back because they weren't good players. And so you do have that connection. And so now having that connection to the Eagles and still being so much a part of the fabric of what that organization is, because like you said, you, Andy, Spags, all you guys, y'all built that. But then having a, a, we'll say a smaller connection to the Kansas City Chiefs right now, how much pride is it though to see so many people that you are affiliated with meet in Glendale, Arizona to decide who the Super Bowl champion will be. Man, you know, first of all, going to your first comment, it still baffles me. And I, I, and I, I do this purposefully too. I, I, I see my success in my life through my 16 year old eyes. So I always take myself back to myself when I was around that age and how I would see myself now. When my 16 year old self sees me being called by the Philadelphia Eagles to come be the captain in an NFC championship game and the city of Philadelphia love me the way that they love me. Are you serious? So I'm still blown away. I'm like, you guys to be kidding me. Like, how, do, how does that happen, right? I'm, I'm not, I don't see myself as what they see, right? And so like, that's an emotional thing for me. So to be, that was an honor for me. I don't, I don't take that for granted. And for a split second, when we were taking captain's pictures, I actually thought I was about to go to battle. <laughs> like, for a split second, man. Like, for a split second, I was bold. Oh. <laughs> well, you still swore. And then, so. and then, but I'm saying, but once we take we got the first couple of steps, I had, no, 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 that's them. Let me, that's them. But, 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 so I love the fact that both organizations, um, Andy has gone from one, and I'm so proud, I'm, I'm proud of Big Red, man. I'm, I don't know, he don't need me to say this, but just, just to watch him, what he's done in two different spots now. Right. The same thing that he did in Philadelphia, he's doing the exact same thing and then some in Kansas City. I think he's the first coach to go from one, to two different teams, organizations, and go to, uh, I think, 10 plus years or something like that, of, of some, some years, some, some crazy records. If you some guys, stat you that's look, only his. Yes, only his, <laughs> yep. only his. And again, 
not only him, but to, but to have Spags there and there's so many other coaches on the coaching staff that were coaches in Philadelphia. It's, it's, it'll be a, a well-warming um, place when I get there before game day. Game day is not going to be warming, but before then, it's going to be a, a lot of warming conversations had. So if I had to guess your pick, we're going... Uh, oh, come on, man. No, I'm just saying. Come like, on, it, it's man. a... And I'm, take off, you got to take oh, off take, your Eagles okay, helmet. Right, take right, off your okay, Eagles right. helmet. Right? You, you, you're sitting there Sunday watching the game. How do you see this going? Man, you know that I'm a defensive guy, right? I do see a lot more points being scored than was in that 49ers game on both for, for both sides. Well, well, not for both sides, excuse me. I, I believe it's going to be in the 30s. I believe it's going to be in the 30s, but I believe the, the Eagles will have just a little bit more in the tank than Kansas City. I think it's going to be a good game. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Sadly, as a defensive player, I don't necessarily like to say that, but I think that that was going to be the case. Um, I saw, I, I did see a stat that the record, they have the same records and the exact same point totals, these teams. That's how equal they are, right? Yeah. So it's going to be a good game. It's going to be a good game. And if you had to put yourself back in that captain's position, playing in today's game, and they say, all right, B, we got 87 this week. Travis Kelsey, with your best secondary, how do you match up with him? Oh, wow. In your prime. So in, in my prime, well, that would have been my responsibility in my prime. And people don't notice that. They think that all I did was hit people hard, which I tried my best to, but I was literally the, sometimes the fourth corner mm -hmm. when Emmett got me there. So I was, a lot, I was a cover guy as well. So that would have been my guy to cover, but that's not a responsibility just for one guy. Mm -hmm. Like, he does so much, and he means so much to the offense that you, you, have to t you have to have a bunch of touch points. I'll say it like that. Different, a whole lot of different touch points as he goes <laughs> into the Rob Sears. Right. And, and what that does is over the game, it may not affect him in the first quarter. It may not affect him so much in the second, but into the third and fourth. If you continue to touch him along the way the whole time, right, by that fourth quarter, he may hopefully, if you're doing it right, he won't be that have that same energy, that same breakaway ability in the fourth quarter, right? So it's it's a it's a long game kind of thing. That's approach. what the Pats did to Marshall in that 0-1 Super Bowl. They yeah. beat him up so bad at yep. the line, but yep. that's another story. Then it's going to be some doubles from time to time. It's going to be different weight, but you have you can't just do one thing the whole game. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If you do one thing the whole game, they're smart. They're going to watch it. They know what teams have done in the past. But if you constantly are throwing different things at that combination again knowing that he is the guy as right now right, he's kind a of, spine he, he, yeah yeah he, he, he's that dude you want to again touch him as many different ways as possible you know I was extremely excited about this I was like man b Dog's gonna be I'm getting on b Dog nerves but I'm just I was so he's like you know we could do it next week RC no I think we need to do it this week <laughs> like I think this week would be nice <laughs> but every offseason I'd pick two or three guys to watch and say, I want to take pieces of their game and try to add them to mine. You were always in that rotation. Now, there were other guys who went in and out of it, but you, for my entire career, were always in that rotation. And the one thing I always got to was, was reckless abandon. And I think people look at that the wrong way. They see reckless abandon as not caring. And you said yourself, I didn't care about myself. I saw it differently when I watched you. I saw reckless abandon as caring too much. Mm, oh yeah. You cared too much about making the play. Oh yeah. You cared too much about winning. You cared too much about your teammates to care about yourself. And I think that's why all of your teammates, all of the people who you have touched throughout your life love you so much. And when we have a great guest or a guest with as much to offer as you, I want to give them this opportunity. If you wanted people to take something away from being around Brian Dawkins, listening to Brian Dawkins, or having an opportunity to watch him play, what would that be? And the show's over. Man, somebody asked me a similar question, um, and it was more about what would be on your grave stone, mm. right? The thing that I would love people to speak about me in terms is um, my passion in which I live my life and that I can be counted and trusted. So if you talk about me in those two, two aspects. So when I, when I speak of passion, I mean the, the lengths that I'm gonna go to be there 
And when I'm, when I'm there, you know I'm there. I'm gonna be there not just in physical form, but I'm gonna be there spiritually. I'm gonna be there mentally. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be everything that I need to be in those moments to help, not just myself, but in my, I, I had to conduct myself, even in my right. most emotional moments in the game, I know my teammates are watching me. So I had to conduct myself and control myself, control my emotions as only to give them what they needed in those moments. Because I know, again, they're watching me. So that passion of how I live my life, how I'm willing to listen to you when you're going through different things, to pour into you if I can. If I can't find, if I don't know the answer, then we're going to go and we're going to find it together. That's how I'm going to walk with you. We're gonna, I'm going to be that type of teammate to walk with you. So the way that I begin to communicate this to myself is excellence. To live with excellence in mind, to chase excellence. So my excellence will be different from your excellence, will be different from yours and so forth and so on. So I'm, I, I was chasing excellence. I stopped comparing myself and I stopped competing so much, not, not against, I'm gonna compete against other teams, but what I'm saying is that I stopped comparing myself to people and competing and I started creating. I started creating the way that I saw safety. I, through my lens, safety was different. A safety was someone that could touch the field and, and, and be a game changer in every statistical category, not just one or two, not just three, but in every statistic. And if you look at what I was blessed to do in every statistical category, I was blessed to be a, a game changer. That's because I was studying film that way. So for those young people that are watching this and you want to be something, yes, follow the examples of those who've set some, right? Because success leaves trails. We've heard that before. But you got to go past that. You got to say to yourself, and I said to myself, what does safety look like? to me. How does a safety dominate the game? Can a safety dominate the game? And if so, how does that look? That's the, and that's how I then approach playing the game, playing the safety. Does, does that make sense? Yes, sir. And so, I know this is supposed to be a short, <laughs> short thing. So Ryan, I, I, I studied pass rush moves because I blitzed a lot. I studied the shot clock of when the team snapped the ball because I needed to be able to time my blitzes. I studied cornerbacks. I studied Troy. Matter of fact, if you looked at me and Troy, sometimes you couldn't tell the two of us apart sometimes because I mimicked some of the things that he did because I was studying. So I was studying every aspect. I studied how to get the ball out, causing, you know, punching the ball out, different angles and different things to do. So I, I went from someone that just made tackles to someone that I know I can make this tackle with a ball at. Mm. So that's the confidence I went to. When you look at it from that lens, you're no longer just playing the game. You're creating, man. So, and that's the joy I took in like watching film because I knew what I was creating. I knew I was creating something different and I was doing something at a different level. And I was blessed to be able to do it. And so ultimately, if I didn't go out and I didn't approach the game the way that I approached it, then I was not giving God, giving God the glory that he deserved. Does this make sense? Yeah. Because when you look at me, and you see the way that I play, I'm going to point you to where my strength comes from. And that's from on high, right? And so that's how it always boils down. Everything that I do in this life, from excellence to creating and all of those things, I want to point anybody who's listening to me right now, I want you to point you to my source. And my source is my Heavenly Father. I'm just a resource. That's it. All right. My dog. Thank you, brother. Appreciate really. you, brother. Yeah, appreciate you. Appreciate, you. appreciate you. All love, brother. Oh, appreciate man. you, baby. Yes, oh, sir. Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'm oh. sitting here. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm outside of the limb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I'm, I'm too <laughs> late. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cow, pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cow, pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the